In summer of 2018, an Aeromexico Connect Embraer 190 crashed just seconds after attempting to take off. It seemed that the aircraft only climbed to just about 30 feet above the runway before it came down. What happened here? Had the nearby thunderstorm something to do with it? Or was there something else at play? Spoiler alert, yes there was. Join me as we find out what happened to Aeromexico Flight 2431. Welcome to Airspace. On July 31st, 2018, the pilots of an Aeromexico Connect Embraer 190 were preparing for departure at Durango, Mexico. The one hour and 40 minute flight should have taken passengers and crew to Mexico City. As the two pilots were preparing for departure, the weather around the airport started to deteriorate rapidly. A thunderstorm was brewing nearby. Nevertheless, the captain and the first officer were relaxed. In fact, they were so relaxed that they allowed a fellow pilot to join them on the flight deck. The young man was very happy about this opportunity, since he was actually in the process of becoming a pilot on the Embraer 190 as well. He had even already passed most of his simulator training in this regard. When the captain and the first officer heard this, they were delighted to have an ambitioned young cadet with them. They even offered him to trade places with the first officer so that the inexperienced pilot could experience his very first takeoff in the cockpit of the aircraft that he would soon be flying regularly. And so they did the unthinkable. The first officer relinquished his seat and moved to the jump seat, while the cadet took a seat at the first officer's station. Soon, the last passenger was on board, cargo doors were closed and the Embraer 190 started taxiing to runway 03 for departure. Meanwhile, the sky around the airport grew darker and darker. As the captain and the unqualified first officer neared the runway, they were given the information that the wind was blowing from the front right at 20 knots. Also, rain had started to fall, but the crew decided to ignore this fact so they would not have to redo their takeoff calculations. In fact, this would very much have been required by general flight procedures. As the aircraft lined up on the wet runway, the controller in the tower had a good view of the arrival of the thunderstorm. It brought along a heavy downpour and severe gusts. But for some reason, the controller decided that this information was not relevant to the aircraft that was about to depart and did not inform the crew of his observations. At 15.22, the captain and his companions commenced the takeoff roll as winds battered the aircraft and heavy rain started to reduce the forward visibility to near zero. Still, the takeoff proceeded normally up to the point where the aircraft reached a speed of 80 knots. At this point the latest, the pilots compared their airspeed indicators to detect any instrument errors or a wind shear condition. When the captain called out 80 knots, it would have been the duty of the first officer to check whether his displays also read 80 knots, and if that was the case, confirm with checked. When the captain made his call out, the first officer hesitated for a short while, then replied with the mandatory checked, even though his speed indication had shown a speed that was almost 10 knots faster than the one of the captain. This was the first indication that the aircraft was entering a wind shear, a phenomenon in which wind speed and direction can fluctuate rapidly. In absence of any other abnormalities, the captain decided to continue the takeoff. At the pre-calculated speed of 147 knots, he gave the order rotate to the cadet so that the latter would raise the aircraft's nose and lift it up into the stormy sky. The aircraft shook as the young man did so, but still it managed to climb away from the runway. After the wheels had left the ground, he ordered the captain to retract the landing gear, just as he had learned in the simulator and on flights on other aircraft. But just seconds after he did so, the wind started shifting more and more. First, it reached a full crosswind, then, as the aircraft started to struggle, it developed into an almost direct tailwind of about 25 knots. This was a far cry from the strong headwind the crew had expected, and it caught the aircraft in the worst possible position, at low speed, just 30 feet above the ground. Meanwhile, the tower controller had lost sight of the aircraft in the heavy rain. He had seen the aircraft disappear into the rain as it was still on the ground, commencing its takeoff roll. He tried handing the aircraft over to the departure radar controller, but never received an answer from the crew. Just as he wanted to check his radar screens, the light in the tower went out, along with all computers and radar information. For 8 seconds, it became very quiet. Then finally, the emergency generator connected, the lights came back on, but unfortunately the radar screens did not. In search of the aircraft, the controller called the departure controller, hoping that maybe the crew had called there without notifying him. But to no avail, the aircraft was nowhere to be found. 
Concerned and fearing the worst, the controller finally ordered cars to perform a runway inspection. Let's go back to the aircraft. It had just lifted off the ground and reached a height of just 30 feet or 10 meters above the ground. The airspeed decreased rapidly due to the quickly shifting storm wind that was now blowing almost directly from the rear side of the aircraft. By now, the captain must have realized that probably he had made a mistake by taking off in weather this severe, accompanied by an unqualified first officer in the right hand seat. The aircraft lost almost 22 knots of speed in a matter of seconds, which made a successful climb all but impossible. The engines were already at maximum power, so at this point, there was nothing the crew could have done to save them from the impending impact. They had brought themselves into a terrible situation. A few seconds after the captain had attempted to regain control of the aircraft, the Empire's hull made contact with the asphalt, about 2150 meters down the runway. Both engines were ripped off and the plane continued to slide along the runway. It took out multiple runway lights and other installations and finally came to rest about 400 meters past the runway end. Luckily, the aircraft's hull remained relatively intact. Immediately after it came to a stop, the crew initiated an evacuation that was rather successful. Still, 14 people including the captain were seriously injured in this accident and another 25 people received minor injuries. The aircraft itself had caught fire soon after the evacuation had started and burned up after everyone had made it out. The evacuees and the burning wreckage was quickly discovered by the vehicles the tower control had dispatched just a minute before. So if you're wondering like I was, how bad must this thunderstorm have been? There are multiple videos of the failed takeoff taken from inside the aircraft. See for yourself. And here's another one, showing the storm moving across Durango. When investigators analyzed the case, they came to the conclusion that the flight had probably fallen victim to an insidious phenomenon called a microburst. A microburst is created by a column of sinking air that after hitting ground level spreads out in all directions and is capable of producing damaging winds, often producing damage similar to that caused by tornadoes. They can sometimes occur below thunderclouds. This theory was further solidified by the last images that the airport surveillance cameras had captured just before dropping offline due to the power outage. Multiple trees were uprooted just as the aircraft was taking off. One of those trees took out the power lines that provided power to the airport. Therefore, the investigation came to the conclusion that the low-level wind shear associated with the microburst had caused the loss of speed and lift and therefore also the crash of Aeromexico 2431. Still, they of course also found fault with the captain's decision to allow an unqualified observer to assume the roles of an active first officer. The captain was not qualified to provide instruction and the observer was not fully qualified to operate this aircraft type. Also, the performance of the air traffic controller and air traffic control services at Durango airport in general were found to be lacking. From the tower, the air traffic controller had a literal first row seat to the approaching storm, but he chose not to warn the crew about his observations. Next, the batteries that should have provided backup power to communications, radar and computer systems were found to be discharged, which resulted in all computers in the tower failing after power was lost due to the damaged power line. It took the emergency generator 8 seconds to come online, which is normal. During the short power transient, the batteries should have kept the computers running. Since they didn't, the computers took over 6 minutes to reboot, by which time the aircraft had already crashed. The entire situation was detrimental to the situational awareness of the controller. Lastly, the board noted that while the controller could have spotted the danger visually, there was no official wind shear detection system installed at Durango. This equipment is costly and usually found rather on larger airports than on regional ones. Had it been installed, maybe the condition could have been detected and the crew would have been warned. You see, this accident was full of strange surprises, subpar decisions and even worse luck. A lot of bad decisions were involved, from the bizarre idea to have an unqualified observer flying in an airliner, to the decision to take off into a thunderstorm. What do you think was the most important factor in this accident? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please subscribe and activate the bell icon. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but it really helps the channel and you too, because you never miss an airspace video. See you all in the next one.